Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You are listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we'll be talking about relationships. That's a wonderful subject most of us like to approach to find out how do we improve relationships, not just with each other, but probably within ourselves, so that the relationships that we have outside improve as well. One of the things we can certainly do is start to break down and analyze myths about relationships. And that's exactly what we'll be doing today as we talk with author of the book 101 Relationship Myths, our guest today, Mr. Tim Ray. Tim, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm now, to be here and connecting in this way. <laughs> Great. Now, tell us uh, how you got started on this uh, particular path about relationships and where the myths started springing up. Was this a personal experience for you? Well, it, it, I spent a lot of time exploring it and working with uh, relationship problems and what we can do about them. And it has been both because of, of my own personal relationship challenges, of which I've had quite a few during the course of my relationship career, and, but it's also been motivated by the work that I've done over the years with clients that have come uh, to my practice and people who have, that I've worked with in my workshops and, and lectures. And what I've found out is that the basic cause of our relationship problems, that the basic reason why so many of us get frustrated and unhappy in our relationships is that we unconsciously believe a lot of stories about love and relationships and men and women and sex and commitment and so on that have very little or nothing to do with the reality of, of relationships, of how they really are. Mm -hmm. And so, so what I've done in my new book is that I have, first of all, I identify what are some of these most basic myths that I've heard over and over again, both in my own personal relationship life, but also everywhere around me. First, I've identified these myths, and then after I've done that, then I subject each story, each relationship story, to what I call reality testing or relationship myth busting to actually really you know, look at it and investigate, well, does this story have anything to do with reality or not? And if not, and if it's a story that actually makes us unhappy, what would it be like to live more in harmony with the reality of things? And, and the answer to that, as I have found out, and which you know, the people that I have worked with have found out, is that it, it always leads to more clarity, more joy, and, and more true love and intimacy. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big myths, obviously, is the story of Cinderella, if you will, or that type of story where you know, uh, she gets whisked off and needs to be rescued, and the next thing you know, he rescues, and the idea is happily ever after. And I say, well, that's fine. Even as a kid, I was thinking, so what happens the next day after that, and then the day after that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, it's funny that you mention that, because I actually have one of the chapters in the book is called what happens to the hero and the heroine after the fight? <laughs> you know, if, if you know he becomes an alcoholic not, because there's no more dragons yeah, yeah, to play. Exactly. <laughs> well, I just think it's so funny also that 99% of all the romantic comedies and, and, and stories that we see you know, in, in movies and on television, they all end at the exact point where they finally fall into each other's arms and they kiss. And then we say, you know, happily ever after. But what about the day after or the week right. after or the month after when they have to actually go through, you know, the process of, of trying to figure out, you know, can, do we have anything in common and can we actually, you know, make things work on a daily basis? No, it's that's what, actually one of the, that's really one of, one of the 101 relationships is, is actually that everyone lives happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Not true as, 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 you know, very obvious when you look at it. I know there was a, uh, there, I've mentioned this uh, book uh, for a time or two throughout uh, many programs that we've done here about relationships, and that's the autobiography of Alan Watts. And he was okay. an Episcopalian minister, and there was a point in his book, he said, I rarely did weddings. He says, but when I did, sometimes this is what you could be known to hear me say, to look at each other carefully and to really enjoy this moment because you're seeing each other at your very best. It can only go downhill from here, <laughs> you know. And he was saying the truth, but he says, you know, if you're willing to embrace those changes that you will experience in each other, you know, and to accept and to grow to love them, your relationship can get stronger. But 
too many people just don't want to do that. They want to show each other, I think, at their very best, you know, the peacock feathers. Then eventually, though, you've got to live with the day in and day out. Oh, he didn't put the toilet seat uh, cover down. She never quits complaining about all the little things, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And you wonder, you know, do relationships, are they really made to last? Are we supposed to be with just that one special person for the rest of our lives? Tell us your thoughts on that based on your book. Well, that, that's a really good question. I mean, that, that is actually one of the stories that, that, that I hear from so many people that I work with that, that are unhappy. Is this story that, you know, a relationship is only a success if it lasts until death do us part. You know, I, 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 you know sometimes I'll have clients who'll come in and they'll, they've just been to, you know, divorce or break up and be really unhappy. And, and you know, I'll, I'll talk to them about what's, you know, why they're so unhappy. And, you know, of course, there, there are many reasons, but one of the stories that a lot of people then have is the story, well, that, you know, that the relationship ended and therefore it was a failure. And, and this will, you know, often you'll hear this from people who've been together for like 10, 15, 20 years, maybe mm-hmm. have two or three, you know, beautiful kids and share a lot of good times together. And yet they have this, this feeling that, you know, because the relationship at some point ended, it means that it was a failure. And then, you know, I, I, that's one of the things I'll question people about. I'll say, you know, well, it's funny, you know, that we have this attitude to relationships at some point ending because we don't really have this attitude towards, say, our job situation. At, you know, nowadays, you know, during the course of our, our work career, it's very normal, you know, that, you know, you'll, you'll be in a job maybe for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and then you'll pass on to another job. But we, we don't have the attitude looking back at, at our past jobs and saying, well, just because I changed from one job to another means that the, uh, the past job was a failure. You know, we look at it as something that, you know, that enriched us and we learned so much from it and, you know, we, we, we had so many great experiences. So, a lot of stuff that we can now take with us, actually, to our next job. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, that has made us grow. So it's, it's a feeling more of richness. So what would it be like? To actually, this is what I asked, what would it be like if you viewed your relationship history in the same light? You know, not as a failure, but actually a success. You know, that you learn so much and you have so much good stuff that you can take with you. And the moment I point that out to people, you, you know, you can immediately see a total change in people's energy because it's like, yeah, you're right. You know, I have so much to be grateful for and, you know, all the love. And so it's a, it's a complete, it's, it's so interesting to see the change that comes you know, with different viewpoints. You know, and that's such a great way to look at things, too, when you talk about, you know, my relationship was a failure, is that, you know, and it seems every other aspect of life, when we take a look at the fact that we had a failure, things didn't work out the way we had hoped they would, that uh, it's actually something that you grow and learn from. Relationships wouldn't be any different then. and also, also, I think even, you know, or maybe even especially the relationships that were, that were really painful to us. I mean, when I look back at some of my past relationships, some of the ones that have been the most painful, even though they were very painful, maybe because they were painful, they were also really the ones that made me grow, you know, that mm-hmm. really enlightened me to myself and, and to, to who I was as a person and, you know, what my values are, what my values are not, and what my behavior is like. So... You know, that there are many ways to look at this. Now, how about this one, then, when you say looking at this, when you have a partner and they have perhaps something that you say, gee whiz, that's such a cute, like, for instance, laugh or whatever it may be, a, a habit that you like. Now you're with them and you can't stand it after a while. <laughs> and you talk about a myth that if we work hard enough that we can change that. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that that's also one of the the, the classic relationship stories that, that so many of us suffer from. You know, if I only work hard enough on on him or on her, right. he or she will, will sooner or later change. Women uh, love doing yeah. that with the bad boys, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it happens to men too. But but sure. you know, at the risk of, of generalizing, I, I will say that I, I do hear it more often from women than, than I hear from men. You know that you know this this story that. You know that he's potential. You know, you know he's got potential, as, as if he was this 
this sort of uh, this this raw piece of rock that you could just sort of chisel away o- over the years, maybe twenty five. Right. Years <laughs> perfect. And if I just put enough years. time in, yeah. Exactly. And I mean, you know, when when I hear that, I always think to myself, H O P E L E S S, hopeless, <laughs> absolutely hopeless. But the reason why it is hopeless, you know, if you, if you subject it to some relationship myth busting, is because when you look deeper you realize that that the reason why this is so hopeless is because you cannot change another human being. You know, the only person that can change your partner is your partner. I mean, sure enough, you can can talk things over and you can suggest, you know, better ways of doing things if, if you have thoughts on that. But after you've done all that, you know, the ball is still in your partner's court and it's up to him or up to her whether they're going to do something about it or not. So, so it's really a very painful belief because it's trying to do the impossible. You know, you cannot change your partner. Mm-hmm. But you know, would you agree that a partner would change a habit, the uh, an annoying habit, or maybe several, over time because a relationship begins to work so well where they sense that you're willing to do the same thing. You know, that you're willing to adapt so that both of you are happy. And it becomes sort of a natural course. That I can see this probably. They're thinking to themselves, this annoys them. So maybe I'll just kind of stop that. Besides, it was bugging me anyway. Yeah, well, as I said, I mean, I'm all for talking things over. Right. Better, better ways of doing things. It's more just, well, I, what I always, one of the things I do when I have, have clients come in and they have, you know, they're unhappy with their partner and, and usually one of the things that they'll, that they'll do, they'll, they'll, they'll give me this long list of things that they're unhappy about. And it's a long list of shoulds usually, you know, he, he should do this or she should do that. And, and, and after we sort of I write it down, the, the, the want list or the should list, then I say, okay, well, let's now compare it to the reality of what is your partner really like. Not what, what you think he or she should be like, not what you wish for or dream about, but just let's get real about the reality as of this moment. And, and, you know, try to, try to compare the two. And then when people do that, they often see that there's often quite, a, you know, a, a, a bit of discrepancy between their shoulds and, and the reality of things. And so, so then in mind, the next thing I say is, well, okay, so th- these are your expectations or your shoulds or your wants. First of all, have you, have you clearly and constructively communicated this to your partner? And, and that it's, you know, it's also interesting to see that a lot of people haven't even done that. We have all these unfulfilled expectations, but we haven't actually really learned how to even communicate it in, in a constructive way. So, mm-hmm. so when people say that, I say, well, first of all, let's go home and, you know, and tell him or her, and then we can take it from there. And then some people then say, well, I, mean, I know immediately that's, that's not possible. Or she, she won't change that or he won't change that. And, or they go home and they whatever. But once they come back for another reality check, and it's like, okay, so this is the reality of the situation. This is actually the way he or she is. And it doesn't at present seem as if there's much chance of any change. Well, that's, I say, well, then that's getting real. Then as far as I can see, you have two options if you want to have peace of mind. The one option is to say, well, okay, he or she is not going to change on those points, but there's so much stuff, good stuff in our relationship that I appreciate so much that I'll, I'll be willing to accept that, and I'll try to get those needs fulfilled somewhere else. Or if those needs or those expectations or wants that you have are so important to you and your partner is not fulfilling them well, then maybe you should consider ending the relationship and finding someone else that is a better match for you. And this is the last thing I add, but remember the next time you go dating or you know, or write your profile on, on, on dating.com to really clearly – Communicate this. Don't wait till ten years later. You know, mm-hmm. you know Tim. I was just kind of curious. See, there was a time and an age we didn't have so much visual and audio technology, where the examples that we had about relationships came from direct experience, your parents or the mm-hmm. community that you lived in, or perhaps by books. Okay, but now we have television, and we have now. Uh, cell phones where you can watch movies and shows and anything you want. And you have shows such as The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Now there's even a new one where they're throwing 
potential dating couples on an island to find out who matches up with who. It, it seems so hedonistic, if you will. What do you think these things are really teaching us, if if they are teaching us anything besides narcissism? What do you think they are teaching us about relationships and you know what the outcomes would be? Well, well, I have to say, you know, from from what I see around me, from from these television shows and reading various, you know, women's magazines and men's magazines and, and you know, about this stuff, I, what I see is still a great proliferation of these uninvestigated stories, what I call these relationship myths, that they're still, most of us, sadly, are, are still, we don't understand. I mean, also one of the things that I, that is really sort of the, the, the foundation of, of my myth busting or reality testing is it's important if you want to really have long-term happiness in your life or in your relationship, it's important that we understand the way our minds work and that that's really our thinking that is the cause of the way we feel in our relationship. It's actually not our partner. And, and what I see today is that you know, most of us are not aware of this basic, very, very important mechanism so, so I think it's yeah, you know, that's also why I'm really all fired up about this work and writing this book because I think it's just so important to that to spread more knowledge about this stuff. And and one of the the responses that I get from from readers of my book is, you know, Tim, man, if only I had learned this in school, you know, if because if, isn't that so interesting? If you think about school and even higher education, you know, we 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 learn so much stuff, but where do we actually learn the art of relationships? You know, right. The art of, of getting along with other people. And not least because relationships is like the number one most important area for us. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, there's, there's been these studies made, you know, out of, there was this big study recently where, where people were asked, you know, what, what's most important to you in life? You know, and there were different things like work and family and relationships, world peace. And and the number one spot was, you know, how can I find and and maintain a happy relationship? It's so important to us, and yet there's so so little knowledge about this. So you're willing to go on the Bachelorette? <laughs> yeah, that's, they can if they call me. I'm willing to to share some relationship myths, but that would be fun actually. I think it would too. So what are you willing to do to vie for my attention, affection, and my Personal relationship. Well, I'm willing to do all the things that might annoy you for the rest of your life, but if we can get through that, I think this could work out. <laughs> now, how about sexual attraction? Call me anytime. Yeah. How, now, how about sexual attraction? I mean, here's one. I, I remember there was a uh, someone I knew years ago, attractive girl, and she went out with this guy, and they said, so how did that work out? And I'd always hear her say the same things. Well, you know, he's a great guy, but I just wasn't sexually attracted to him. And I thought to myself, well, I guess you don't really want much from somebody, do you? <laughs> so what, yeah, what's yeah. The, what about that? Does that mean that that's a good match, or is that a myth? That's an interesting question. Well, one, one of the, the relationship stories that I investigate the book, that, that is actually one that I personally have suffered from so much, is this relationship story that strong sexual attraction means that we're a good match. And, and and I'm not the only person on the planet, I will have you know, because right? it's really something that is really, really <laughs> out there. Oh, yeah. And, and it's, it, was, it was actually it's, it's one of the first relationship stories that I actually personally myth-busted when I started this work several years back. And when I asked myself, you know, is this really true, that strong sexual attraction means that we're also a good match, the answer just blew my mind because I could immediately see that even though in so many of my previous relationships there have been strong sexual attraction, you know, falling in love, feeling high and blissful, I also had to admit that we weren't a very good match on several very important points. But because I was so... You know, because I was so, so much in the thrall of these strong emotions and also believing in this story that, that these emotions are a, a healthy compass for a relationship, I, I didn't see that. And, you know, the, the, the consequence of that was me ending up in, in several relationships where we were just not good matches. And, you know, after the first sort of, 
I call it the first three months, you know, the first three months of falling in love. The days sort of start to clear a little bit. You know, I, I, I woke up one morning, and I guess my partner woke up too, and we looked at each other, and I'm like, hmm, you know, we're just not a very good match. And 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 just for me to, after I'd misbusted this story and, and saw that, it, it also changed my whole attitude to to dating and to, to to relationships dramatically because suddenly I I stopped using that as a compass and 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 started. It's not that I don't have those strong feelings <laughs> anymore, but I I stopped using them as the only compass. You know, mm-hmm. I, I started having another compass, and and I can only tell you that my uh, relationship life has, has just benefited so much from that. I know I remember a shirt many years ago that says, I believe we should have a lot more in common in our relationship than just great sex. <laughs> and then after that, do you drink? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now, as far as myths are concerned, uh, what do you consider to be probably the most dangerous one that people can buy into? The most dangerous one? Yeah. I think I think the most one of the strongest and and most uh, you know damaging relationship myth is the, the belief that my happiness is dependent on my partner. Oh and boy, that is a big one. Yeah, yeah. Of course, also this, this belief also really goes to the heart of, of what the book is about. So the belief is my happiness is dependent on my partner, or you could say that the way I feel in my relationship. It's dependent on what my partner does and says or, or, or doesn't say and doesn't do. And at first glimpse, you know, first glance, it may seem true, you know, because when my partner does this thing or says this thing, well, I react in a certain way. And not only do I react in a certain way, but it's actually every time my partner does or says a certain thing, I react in the exact same way, which seems to indicate that this story is actually true. But if we do some reality testing on it and look closer, if you if you actually look closer, you will see that it's actually. Well, let me give you a concrete example. Actually, a, a good example that I use when I give lectures. I ask people. Let's say. Let's say, for example, that your partner uh, invites you to go with her or him to the sort of the big family get together. So you 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 invited your partner, and your partner says no, right? Mm-hmm. How do you react to that? Your partner saying no, and then I ask the audience, say, okay, so how many of you, if your partner said no to going to the big family get together, uh, would get upset, you know, or hurt? You know, then you know some of the people in the audience they they raise their hands. And, okay, then I say, well, so how many of you would be sort of neutral? Don't really care one way or the other, and then there's some people, some other people who raise their hands. And then I say, okay, so how many of you would be, you know, really worried about having to spend an entire evening alone <laughs> with your family? And you have some some more people who raise their hands. And then I say, well, so how many of you would actually think that this was actually exciting and fun to have an evening alone for once without your partner, with your family? And then some more people raise their hands. And this, the fact that people. You know, different people react differently to the exact same experience. Right. Is a, is a fact of monumental importance, not only when it comes to relationships, but just to our lives in general, because it shows us that it's actually not what happens to us that is the cause of how we feel and react. It, because if it was, everybody would react the exact same way to the exact same experience, and we don't. So it can't be the outer thing that's the cause of it, what then is the cause of it? What is the, I call it the X factor. And if you look at the X factor, you'll see that the X factor is actually your own thinking. It's your own interpretations and stories of what's going on that is the cause of your reaction. So if you think that your partner saying no is, is, is bad and horrible or a sign that he or she doesn't love you or care about you, well, obviously you're going to be pretty upset. But if you have a different interpretation of it and you think, well, that's wonderful that your partner is you know, getting some time on her own and it's wonderful that you get to be her, then obviously you're going to have a different reaction. So going back to this myth or this story, my happiness is dependent on my partner, that's actually how we can see that it's actually a myth because 
people react differently to different experiences. Mm-hmm. And that's a, just a, an amazing discovery because that really means, you know, freedom. It's the key to freedom. Mm-hmm. It means that no longer is your happiness in your relationship or in any er- other area of your life dependent on your partner and what goes on around you. It's dependent on your own thinking, your own interpretations. And your own thinking, your own interpretations is something that is within your power to look at and work with. So it's really empowering. It's really taking back the power to yourself to to look at this and realize this. So, Tim, it sounds true then that if there is something in your partner that you wish to see change, that you have to be that change in order for you to see it. That's that's also very very true, and that that's mm-hmm. definitely one of the things that that I always, you know, that that we end up with when I work with clients. You know, so they they tell me the things, the change that they want to see, and and of course one of my, my first questions is, well, how good are you, you know, at this behavior that you want to see? Are you that understanding, you know, compassionate, tolerant, uh, clearly communicating person that? you want your partner to be. And and in many cases people, you know, they have to admit that they you know, they have quite a bit to go themselves. And so I say to people, well, maybe you should start. You know, that's 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 something that's doable. Mm-hmm. You know, changing your partner, that's pretty impossible. But you, that's doable. And and then as you also say, one of the things that happens is that if you start really fundamentally changing your thinking and your behavior, you know, your your partner will you know, usually notice that, and it's interesting to see what that will lead to. Because mm-hmm. change is inevitable. You know, a great relationship may start off, you know, looking real beautiful in the beginning, but it just won't stay consistently that way because I believe that we just change over time. You know, there are things that we used to love that we just no longer like anymore, and things that we used to not like, we began to love. I mean, that's the beauty about uh, adaptation mm-hmm. is to be, like Bruce Lee says, be like water. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's life, right? Nothing in life is permanent. You know, we mm-hmm. we, we change, and sometimes our values change, and our goals change. So, and that's that's also another of the the stories that 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 make us unhappy is this idea that things shouldn't change. You know, that's that's one of the main stories that I hear from people coming and say, well, you you promised, or you said, or you were like this, and. Well, okay. If if we get real about it, you know, people people change. You know, he's mm-hmm. changed. She's changed. You've changed. Let's mm-hmm. get real about that. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of trying so rigidly to hold on to some past story. Fascinating topic. It always is, especially from the many perspectives that you can glean from it. Now, Tim, I know that you have a blog uh, that people uh, should probably take the opportunity to go and visit. Tell us where they can find that. Is that also with your website as well? It is. Okay. Uh, my my website is uh, the, the address is beamteam dot com. That's b e a m t e a m dot com. One oh. word. And on the website, you can actually read. Uh, I, I put a free thirty page extract of the book One One Relationship List. And and you can also read you know lots of other stuff, uh, articles and, and, and things about my work and my you know the the approach that I this getting real approach that I work with. So break the relationship myths and begin to enjoy yourself as you find that wonderful relationship that's made for you and you for someone else. Tim Ray joining us here on the Beyond Fifty Radio program. Great pleasure to have you on the program. I understand that things are just working real well, especially when it comes to doing your lectures. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks. It's been good to be on Beyond 50 Radio. Although you I bet. have to admit, I'm not, I'm not quite Beyond 50 yet, but I'm working yeah. on it. Yeah, relationships at this age definitely take on a different tone because we no longer really care about how we look or feel as far as attracting someone else. We say, this is who we are. Are you willing to take this? I keep remembering a, a funny Andrew Dice Clay quote that says, I don't play hard to get. I play hard to want. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Tim Ray, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thank you, Daniel. We also want to thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50 
We do have a free weekly e-newsletter that you can sign up for. We'll also have a nice post here for Tim Ray and how you can find out more about 101 Relationship Men's. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you again for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. Remember, live your day past halfway.